Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington. The spikes in global food prices in 2007, 2008 were a wake-up call. There's something fundamentally wrong with the global food system, and it's about to happen again. Commodity prices doubled in 2008, and the estimated number of hungry people topped 1 billion, and food riots spread throughout the developing world. Well, a second price spike in 2010-2011, which is expected to drive the global food import bill for 2011 to an astonishing $1.3 trillion. This only deepened the sense that the policies and principles guiding agricultural development and food security were deeply flawed. Now there's widespread agreement that international agricultural prices will remain significantly higher than pre-crisis levels for at least the next decade with many warning that demand will outstrip supply by 2050 unless concerted action is taken to address the underlying problems. Well, a new report titled Resolving the Food Crisis, Assessing Global Policy Reforms Since 2007 from the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy and Tufts University Global Development and Environment Institute offers some answers to these questions. And with me today are the report's authors, Timothy A. Wise, is a research and policy director at the Global Development and Environment Institute, and Sophia Murphy is a senior advisor at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. Thank you both for joining us. Good to be here, Paul. So, Tim, let me let me start with you. First, give us a sort of overview of what you found in your report. Our main finding was that the the fundamental underlying causes of the crisis have yet to be addressed. That some of the urgency went out of that uh, initial. Uh, surge in interest, um, and and that in fact there are uh, the the underlying causes remain. The, um, we we sit poised on the verge of what could well be yet another food price spike that sends uh, millions more um, into poverty and hunger. In fact, as we talked about in an in a earlier interview, uh, while there was a lot of rhetoric leading into the recent G20 meetings about addressing food security. Not a heck of a lot happened, nor, nor the follow-up of WTO, right? And not, not much really came out of that either. Uh, Sophia, so talk a little bit about your study then. It's a very comprehensive and detailed study, and we can't get into it all now. But you, 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 uh, there were three main issues you think needed to be addressed when, as Tim talks about, underlying issues. So what are they? Well, a big one is around... Um um, the use of biofuels, which leads into questions about how we use the resources we have. And I think that for, especially for the G20 governments, they still shy away from acknowledging that there might be limits to growth, if you like. And that um, while they've been happy to put a lot of money and energy into production and increasing the output, they haven't been willing to look at how we use food where food gets wasted, and how the transformation of food into biofuels in particular has created a very substantial uh, spike in demand that had immediate effect on price and which continues to pose a lot of challenges. So that would be a first. Um, the second, I would say, is around financial speculation and the fact that by not separating anymore the way the insurance and finance and commodity futures markets work as in a vast increase in the amount of money coming into commodities markets and uh, a failure to regulate it which the Dodd-Frank legislation in the states last year set out to try to do but didn't really succeed in doing and the third thing would be land grabs where you have a huge new interest by investors and also by some governments that are big net food importers to secure their food by actually growing it and shipping it straight to their countries where they are and, um, and therefore creating a lot of interest particularly in Africa where there's a lot of fertile land and a lot of people without a lot of political power to hold on to that land and so a big pressure to take over large areas for production, for export, um, or to hold a speculation. So there's, there's a second use for the land, which is just to, to buy it and wait till the price goes up. Right, Tim. Well, let's, let's dig into these three main areas to start with. And why don't we work backwards, start with land grab. G give us an, some examples of, of what, what you mean by land grab, and then what kind of policy are you proposing to deal with it? Well, the, the land grab problem has come, in, come to, uh, to urgent attention because of um, um, huge and, and largely unregulated um, purchases and leases of agricultural land, as Sophia pointed out. 
the scale of this is just phenomenal. I mean, you're talking about, I mean, a, a study by the uh, Land Matrix Partnership estimated that um, since 2001, 227 million hectares of land, 227 million hectares had been um, leased by really sovereign wealth funds, as Sophia pointed out, in um, in countries that are resource poor um, and want to guarantee their future food access, or um, or by um, speculators who see land as a valuable commodity that will increase in value over time and that it's worth holding on to. It's sold as a, um, as a form of agricultural development, but in fact, um, the kind of agricultural development, even where you get agriculture being started on that land is problematic and the people who are on it, and there are people on a lot of that land um, with precarious tenure rights get thrown off. So. So the the um, there are international um, discussions going on, on at this point uh, from the World Bank on down to the FAO and and they recognize that this is a huge problem. They're calling for responsible agricultural investment and codes for such um, such investment. But um, until those are in place and until there's a regulatory framework that can really restrict this, um, it compromise. It, there needs to be a moratorium on on these kinds of measures. Governments need to be empowered to put moratoria on the, the transfer of land, of uh, their agricultural land to um, to foreigners and to investors like can, that. Under under WTO rules, can a can a sovereign nation actually stop a foreign country coming in or company corporation buying up its land? There have been a number of cases where where governments have actually already put some restrictions on these. A moratorium while regulations get developed, I think is not, uh, I'm not sure, Sophia may have more information than I do, but I don't think the WTO is the main obstacle to that kind of a restriction. Right. I mean, I know this is happening in Africa. It's also happening in Canada. There's large corporate buy-ups of wheat fields going on. Uh, Sophia, so is it what is what bars the way, or is there any motivation? Do you see any sign that some of these governments want to stop this from happening? Well, I think there are, as Tim said, there are governments that have moved to to do something. I, it, a lot depends on the politics. So, um, there are, where, where there is an accountable government in place, there has been a better response than than where that um, accountability from the government is not so well developed. I think that um, in countries like Canada and Australia, part of it is is invisible to most people. Those are countries where there's huge amounts of farmland, over 90%, even 95% of the population is urban, and no one really sees those resources. The whole decline of a rural population has happened um, out of sight, if you like. And I think it takes a while to generate a response there. And also, you know, in, in those countries, people are used to thinking of land as, a, as an investment asset. I think in, in countries in Africa, land is everything. It's all the people have. It's often communally held. There are no, there's no one to go and buy the land from exactly. The land is held by a village or by, by different kinds of communities. And it's much more difficult to establish title. But it's also much more difficult politically once the community is mobilized to take the land away. They have a different relationship with it. So I think what there is right now is a free-for-all. The WHO has very little regulation in this area. There's very little by way of framework or, or you know, blueprint or guidelines. The, the negotiations at the UN are trying to get voluntary guidelines together. It'll be very weak, but it will at least allow countries that are interested to see what kinds of questions they ought to ask, what models are out there to strengthen the conditions of the investment agreements. So there's definitely things to be done, but, but right now, compared to the scale of the grabs, nothing is happening. Tim, so all this has to do with concentration of ownership, and that has a lot to do with price volatility. Uh, you, you said at the beginning of the interview we could be looking at another massive uh, spike in 2010, 2011. Uh, why, why do you say that? Well, I think the, one of the, uh, the disturbing things that we found here is that despite all of the genuine... Um, Activity. Um, there was a there was a lot of concern and and effort put in internationally in all these institutions and beyond the institutions that we looked at. We looked at five uh, institutions in detail um, to see how they've responded. In spite of all of that, if you look if you look closely, the two main things driving food prices higher at an underlying level are biofuels expansion, ethanol expansion in particular, and the price spikes are coming from widespread speculation and volatility. So commodities as an asset class, neither of those has been regulated, um, despite 
some efforts to do so through the Dodd-Frank Act, through um, through European um, regulations. And so they haven't been re-regulated to a point that one could guarantee against another another um, uh, flood of speculative money coming into commodities and driving prices up. And biofuels remains, biofuels are expanding as we speak, dependent at this point on government subsidies that support them in, a, in key countries like the United States, and also on um, on the high price of oil, making biofuels a, a, a strong investment. What do you want seen done on biofuels? What kind of legislation do you think needs to be passed? Well, I think the, the most obvious um, uh, legislation, legislative changes, regulatory changes that could happen would be if the if the main developed countries that are um, providing subsidies and other incentives for biofuel expansion um, remove those, that would decrease the pressure and the incentives to convert land um, and crops to biofuels. That said, if the price of if the price of oil remains high, biofuels will, re- will remain competitive, and I think it's an open question whether um, whether the food versus fuel um, problem will be will be solved by well does it need more than just lack of subsidies does it need some form of regulation or does it that there needs to be some intervention saying you know not so much land can be put towards biofuels I mean yeah. is there any, anything short of that going to be effective well there it may well be be that that's true it's um, I, I think at this point the first step and it's a relatively straightforward first step from a policy perspective is to say, whoa, this is having an impact on the underlying prices of foods. It's driving them up to unaffordable levels. And um, government policies that, that provide incentives for that expansion need to, uh, need to be reduced and eliminated. That would really be a first step. I think then we'd have to assess where we are depending on the price of oil, on the competitiveness of the other uh, biofuels and the evolution of the biofuels market. Sophia, it seems to me if you don't take on these big commodity traders who are making more money than any of the tech or telecommunications companies. It, it is a huge and perennial problem. They have uh, been powerful for a long time. You know, Cargill's been pretty big in grain for 150 years, coming up to 200 years. Um, I think that, well, definitely the deregulation of the commodity markets had a big impact. And the banks both got into commodity trade and the commodity traders got into hedge funds and investment portfolios that look a lot more like banking. And at the moment, the grain companies continue to be allowed to basically do insider trading on the grounds that they're hedging their risk as traders of physical commodity. And they argue that there are you know, glass walls between their investment wings and their um, trading business, which raises a lot of eyebrows, honestly. It, it's difficult to see how you could keep those businesses clean and entirely separate. So, so there's been a big kind of wash where the banks look more like traders and the traders are more like banks. And a lot of the traders' um, advantages, I guess, or a lot, of the, a lot of what was considered normal practice for traders, I think needs to be looked at really hard now that they are allowed to do what bankers used to do as well. I don't see any effort or I don't see, I see effort to stop that. It was clear in Dodd-Frank that uh, Cargill and companies like them had many, many meetings with the federal regulators and were clearly very concerned to see that the outcome not limit their ability to do what they were doing to make money. And they more or less succeeded. So I guess the pressure or the need for pressure remains to to bring that regulation in. You could do things in the U.S. that would regulate the commodity markets and wherever the companies were based, it would affect them because they have to trade on the Minneapolis, Chicago, New York um, exchange floors. That's where most of the grains are traded, some in France. And again, the EU is just begun to think about this issue but you can it doesn't matter so much where the companies are headquartered in this case what matters is where the commodity markets are regulated from and with london paris and especially dc you would be a long way forward i guess the problem tim is that's precisely is the political problem in the u.s all the trading's more or less coming through the u.s on the other hand they couldn't get even limited position limits passed at the futures trading commission Right. It's uh, the, the reforms have been very limited. It's um, they're not unimportant, but they're um, but I, I know a few people who think that they're going to be effective at limiting the kind of uh, financial financialization of the commodity markets that we've we've seen in recent years. Right. Well, final word. What do you, if people are going to demand something? Uh, what are they going to demand? 
I think what people are demanding is um, is regulation, um, and I, I think we're where we're most encouraged in in looking at the uh, at the global scene following um, these food price spikes is at the developing world. Um, the developing world uh, has gone from a net food um, exporter to a net food importer um, in a massive way, and this um, the drive up in prices has 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 created huge fiscal pressures on them on their food import bills. Um, and um, I think really strained the credibility of the wisdom that you could always just trade for your food and go to your comparative advantage, even if it wasn't food. So they've been much more assertive. Um, African countries, a number of African countries have been very assertive in what they want. And even as a group, um, uh, they responded to the G20, actually, with a, a, a very um, decisive statement saying, um, and I quote this, it comes from the African Union, actually. African countries are not looking forward to depending continuously on external supplies that will remain uncertain in prices and quantities. Actually, our ultimate and unquestionable ambition is to develop our own agriculture and markets. In our opinion, we must rely on our own production to meet our food needs. In fact, importation is not Africa's goal. That is as clear a statement as you could want, that there needs to be a change in business as usual, that there needs to be support for the kind of agriculture that developing countries, African countries do, that involves smallholders, that involves women, that involves low input systems, not uh, not high input monoculture systems, that involves the kind of agricultural development that I think can really address the food uh, crisis in the long run and also um, support uh, poverty alleviation and development in the countries that need it most. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you for joining us on the Real News Network.